almost every world record from that era has been broken. I think there's only a few left. Um, so it's crazy how much the sport has changed and gotten faster, even without that technology. Mesdames et messieurs, the greatest festival of our contemporary society, the Olympic Games, is about to begin. This is going to be close. Oh! You can do it! You can do it! Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant! But that is an Olympic champion. Ready? Hello and welcome to another episode of Olympic Fever, the podcast for Olympics fans. I am your host, Jill Jarrett, joined as always by my lovely co-host, Allison Brown. Allison, hello. How are you today? Were you in Lake Placid this week? No, I wish I was. Because contributor Ben was posting pictures. Oh, he's posting pictures from when we went a few years ago. Oh, I got confused because I said, did Jill go to Lake Placid without me? I know. I was a little concerned. No. I was feeling a little rejected. Don't worry. Don't worry. Okay. Okay, good. Although I really want to go when they do their, they're doing a big hullabaloo for uh, the 40th anniversary of the 1980 games with a lot of stuff going on. And I do want to go to that. I don't know if I'll be able to. Because it may be, you know, a blizzard. It is like Placid. It is like Placid. <laughs> but on a warmer note, we're going back in the pool. I know. I'm very excited. We're going to talk swimming this week. But before we get to that, we'd like to give a shout out to our Patreon patron of the week, Patrick Alog. And Patrick, we also know him as Patrick from Green Bay. And we love it when Patrick talks to us about Olympics. And he's a lot of fun, loves curling and things like that. So thank you so much, Patrick, for supporting our show. We really appreciate it. And if you would like to learn more about becoming one of our patrons of the week, visit patreon.com slash olimfever and find out more. So yes, we are headed into the pool today with Mallory Comerford. Mallory is an American swimmer who competes in freestyle and relays. In college, she swam with the University of Louisville, where in... Go Cardinals! At the 2017 NCAA Division I Women's Championships, she tied with Katie Ledecky to win the 200 freestyle. And then at the 2017 World Championships, she won gold in five relays. Currently, she swims on the U.S. national team and on the International Swim League for the Cali Condors. And she is an ambassador for Arena Swimwear. Take a listen to our interview with Mallory. Mallory, thank you so much for joining us. You swim mainly freestyle, right? Yes, correct. I swim mainly freestyle with a little bit of butterfly, but very little. When... I look at a competitive swimming pool, judges walking up and down the sides and judges at the ends of every lane. What are those judges looking for? In swimming, there's officials that officiate every meet. Um, so it'd be a, a like qualified meet, as in like the Olympics or Olympic trials, any big meet, even small meets. You're required to have these officials to make the times count. So these officials, for each stroke, there are different rules. Luckily, in freestyle, as in free, you're pretty much allowed to do whatever you want besides touch the bottom of the pool, pull on the lane lines, interfere with another swimmer. Um, so that's mainly what they're, what they're looking for. In other strokes, there's a lot more rules. Your kicks have to be together. You have to touch with two hands, turn properly, all this stuff. But the biggest thing in freestyle that they're looking for, I guess, is the start and making sure that you are not false starting. Okay. So every race, you obviously start at the blocks and they say, take your mark, go. And it doesn't happen very often, but it can, you can false start. You, you're nervous, you hear something. And so that's what they're looking for in those cases. So false start is just going before the official gun goes off. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, that it'll be like take your mark and somebody could you can even just flinch just a little bit and that counts as a false start like you're not even actually entering the pool before anyone else it's probably more of a disadvantage because you're psyching yourself out but if you technically flinch that is a disqualification oh, wow and you do you get dq'd right away the first one or do you get a second try no you so you could swim the race completely and not know that you got disqualified most of the time if you false start you usually know but you you go they go ahead with the race unless it's like very very obvious and the person falls in the pool 
before everything else. But if it's just a flinch, you swim the whole race, go the whole race, and then you get out and they tell you that you're disqualified and you don't get another chance. Oh, man. Yeah. That would stink. <laughs> when, yeah. when was the last time you got DQ'd? I have actually only been DQ'd once in my entire life. Um, luckily, I think it's mainly because I do swim freestyle and not a different stroke. I got disqualified for a false start. I flinched on the blocks, but luckily I was just racing a hundred yard freestyle. So 50 some seconds and I was done. So it wasn't like I was swimming for five minutes and then I get out and they tell me. So I've been very fortunate that it's only happened once, but I still remember like the exact race, the exact pool, like exactly what happened. Let's talk about the start for a minute. Most starting blocks are slanted to give mm-hmm. you some better leverage. Do you do like that track start or do you do with both feet at the edge of the, the block? Well, I only know like one or two people that still do both feet forward in the international racing. Um, so I do a track start and they've actually added like a wedge to the block. So there's the block and there's like a kind of like a wedge on the back to get even more leverage and more push. Um, that's been there for, I don't know how many years now, but um, the blocks at like the Olympic level and international level are all the same. They're called Omega blocks. And um, I've been very fortunate to be able to get used to the blocks. They're a little bit different than, I guess, blocks in college swimming or just around. And so I've gotten really used to starting on those blocks. And we have two at the pool that I train at so I can practice more on them and get used to the feeling and perfect my start even more. So what makes a good start for you? Like what, what do you try to do? My start, I'm still working on a lot. It's come a long way, but still has a long ways to go. So when I'm on the block, I think about getting my hips up high. So I'm in the right position to even start to even begin with. And then I set up my head correctly. And then when I hear like, take your mark, go, I kind of clench my, or prepare my arms to pull on the blocks. And then through the air, I think about leading with my head and keeping my face forward and then everything else following. So my goal is to get out as far as possible and as high as possible using my legs and my arms, but then entering as smoothly and as efficiently as possible into the water to, we call it like hit the hole into the water. So you surge through the water and are moving as as efficiently as possible from the beginning. Once you're in the water, do you want to be deeper in so you can get more underwater kicking, or do you want to get to the t- surface as fast as possible? Um, or does so it, it depend on the race? It depends on the race. It depends on the swimmer, whatever their strengths are. So, for example, like in a 50 freestyle, I'll try to get to the surface a little bit faster than I would, say, a 200 freestyle, just because you want to get up and start moving as fast as possible. But there's a fine, like for me, there's a really fine balance of kicking underwater far or getting up and swimming. I want to find that happy medium of finding that exact right place to come up and start swimming. And that's something I work on with my coaches. We take times to like the 15 meter mark and see like how many kicks did I do to go this many seconds? How many kicks did I do to get to that point at however many seconds? So it's like very specific, but also it's kind of going off of um, a feel and um, knowing your body and understanding where you're at in the water. How easy is it to get thrown off of that start rhythm? You know, if you stayed just, you know, a tenth of a second too long underwater or, you know, how delicate is that for you? For me, I like my transition from being underwater to swimming like that's one of my strengths, but I know like for me on my start, like if I mess one little thing up, it can throw off everything. So like if I forget or just like don't execute my start as well, that can kind of mess up that transition and you don't hit that transition as well as you would like to. And it all it takes is like pulling just significantly or not significantly less than you did like the last time when you had a perfect start. It could be like something so minor, but it's just being trying to be as aware as possible and practicing it as much as you can and just getting used to that feeling. So are you trying to build as much muscle memory as possible? Or like when something doesn't go right, do you work on mental things to just 
get past that and transition to something that is working? Um, I think it's a lot of muscle memory. I think that's what's helped me the most is just really watching myself do it. We always, we video my starts and try different things. So once we find something that works, really trying to rehearse that over and over again and kind of ingrain that into my mind. Because when you're in a real race, sometimes those things kind of slip out of your mind just because you're so excited to race and all that adrenaline is there. So when the pro- more you practice it, the more natural it becomes and just like second nature, you just go to that. So I think that's the biggest thing is just continuing to train your body to understand what it needs to do. So when you practice starts, are you just practicing starts? Like, is there a point of practicing where you just do starts over and over and over again? Yes and no. So starts are like, they're very taxing on your body. They're, it's a lot of, a lot on your legs and your muscles. So we try to limit the, like, I guess the repetitions, especially you don't want to just kind of do reps just to do reps. You want to do good, solid reps, kind of like anything else you're going to do, lifting, swimming, running, like anything you do, you want to do, you want to have high quality. So on Tuesday and Friday mornings, we have what we call power mornings and we do a lot of explosive things um, in practice and some of that is starts, but then other days we'll have 30 extra minutes after practice to work on different things and the coaches are all available and some days I'll work on my starts and we'll just, we'll do a little progression working on different things. So we'll do four or five starts, nothing crazy and always trying to end on a good one. I like to always try to end on a good one. Um, just so you feel that and remember what that was like. What about relays and the transitions from swimmer to swimmer? What what has to happen in order for the next swimmer to start? Yes. Yeah, so that's a little even more complicated. I like relay starts because, I mean, I've done college. I did college swimming for four years and did tons of relays in that environment. So the goal of a relay start is to be as fast as possible off the block but the swimmer has to touch before your toe, like your big toe leaves the block. So their hand has to be touching the wall and your toe still has to be on the block for it to be a legal relay start. So you can get disqualified, like a lot of, I would say that's a pretty common disqualification is people leaving early on a relay. Uh, So they have like reaction time pads on the blocks that they go off of and they also have the officials watching. So if the official sees it, they'll call it and then they'll check the pads. Or if the pads tell them that the reaction was negative 0.1, then you're disqualified. So you want to be above 0.00, um, but you don't want to be too high. So like a normal flat start reaction right, is usually like around 0.68 to 0.78. That's like a pretty good tar- target time. And then on a relay exchange, it'll be like our goal is always to be around 0.1. So it's way faster than a regular start. You just have more momentum and you're kind of going off of something rather than uh, anticipating the take your mark go. In relays, do you do that wind up start now? Yes. So, okay. So you do a wind up start. Okay. Yes. The relay start has kind of evolved over the past few years as college swimming has gotten bigger Um, more innovative things have gotten quicker and people have come up with different ways with the start that I do is called like the step over start so you put one foot up on the block and you step over the wedge that I was talking about and you kind of launch yourself off the front of the block and it's super explosive and powerful Um, I love doing them they're a lot of fun and you just really enter the water at a high speed and it sets you up really great for a race now would that be legal in Olympic competition Yes. So that's all legal. It's starting. So it's really popular in the U S and then it's starting to travel like other things like travel around the world with technology other countries are starting to pick it up and just, it's faster. It takes a little bit longer to learn, but it definitely is faster and more effective. I personally think, I mean, I use it, I've used it for the past four years and it's super effective and efficient. So I think it will be very common. You'll see a lot of people having their foot up on the block and taking over in, in the Olympics. Okay, so you started, you're in the in the pool, you're in the lane. A lot of the times the announcers will talk about drafting off the swimmers to either side of you. Uh-huh. So is there an optimal place 
in the lane for you to be? Yeah, so honestly, I really never think about drafting when I'm swimming unless I'm swimming. Like, so now there's mixed relays in international meets. So like at World Championships and this next summer at the Olympics, there will be male and female, like mixed gender relays. So that's really the only time I've ever thought about drafting just because if you're if there's a male in front of you and you're a female, they're going to have this huge wave and it could be very beneficial to draft off of you. And I think like as female swimmers, it's not as much as of an influence as it, as it is for male swimmers. Um, I think about it, I guess, sometimes like really big meets or if I'm trying to do go out really fast with somebody fast in a hundred freestyle thinking about that. Um, it's definitely more for sprinting events, but it's not something that I really focus on a whole lot, but I know like the guys really always talk about it and try to be like, Oh, we're going to get an awesome draft from this guy, or we're going to try to catch this guy's draft in this race or whatnot. That's really interesting. So in mixed relays, do you know your order ahead of time and stick with it? Or do you look at your lane assignments and go, huh, I got a couple of guys next to me. Maybe we'll change the order and have a girl race when the guys race to get that extra draft. Usually for the most part, well, so you have to set your relay. I think it's like an hour before the session starts. So once the session starts, you can't change it. Um, I think unless there's like a medical emergency or something like that. Most of the time, they'll have the boys go first to make sure there's not as many waves. Um, so you're not swimming in waves as like the girls are jumping in. So the goal is to get as far as ahead, far ahead as possible to have clear water for it. So when the girls jump in, there's clear water. So that's always the goal. That's not always necessarily how it goes. Just, I mean, it's all based on math. We have um, super great team of people who figure out the exact details and exact numbers of every possible combination of swimmers what what it should be it's not necessarily what they're going to go but they try to put the best relays together with the information that they have and it's not always going to be two guys in the front it just doesn't work like that but like on a freestyle relay a mixed freestyle relay they'll almost always go the boys in the front interesting all right so we're back in the pool when you're swimming i've noticed that when the the race is shorter like a 50 or 100 the stroke cadence I guess or speed and the kick strength seems to be different than like say a 200 or a 500 what's the reason behind that just being being able to um do that kick for that long is it's not necessarily impossible but um you just have to be smart and how long you can hold on to that type of kick so like in a 50 freestyle your stroke tempo is going to be a lot faster than your 200 because personally I can't hold that tempo for 200. I can only hold it for a 50 and same with like the kick. So in the 200, like when I swimming, I'm swimming a 200 freestyle. I have like a kick for each 50 of the race. So I like transition from like a lighter kick into a little bit tighter kick and then into an all out kick at the last 50. So that's like kind of how I imagine swimming the race, but Um, For me, like something I'm working on right now is making my kick stronger for the 200 and being having a more consistent kick throughout the race. Um, Some people are really good at kicking, so they're going to utilize their kick throughout the race more. And some people are better at pulling, so they're going to use their pull to their benefit. So when you talk about light kick and strong kick, are you talking about the turn of the, the how many kicks per stroke? Or are you talking about the actual look or depth of the kick? I guess it would be more like to other people, like people watching, they would notice like a change in the kick and the splash. Um, but for me, it's, it's more off of a feel and a connection in the water. So my kick drives my arms, my tempo of my arms. So I know if I'm kicking a certain way, my tempo is most likely at this. And then when I start kicking more, my tempo should increase. It doesn't always happen, <laughs> but that's kind of the way I look at it. And it's more off of a, feel and connection type of thing but visually you'll be able to like you can see the difference as I build into my kit what makes a good flip turn oh that's or take it or walk us through a flip turn or swim us through a flip turn how about (laughs) (laughs) so as you approach the wall it's really good to go into the wall not looking at the wall obviously because that's going to stop you slow you down if you're picking your head up 
So using the tea on the bottom of the pool and kind of submerging yourself. So a lot of people like to stay on top of the surface and just flip right there. But for me, like I like to submerge. So I kind of cut a corner a little bit and really tuck. And the most important part is the push off the wall. So getting that, setting yourself up for that really good push off the wall and carrying your speed that you were carrying from the race or like the previous lap into that turn so you can carry it out. Um, a lot of people think like a turn is a resting point, but it's definitely not. It's a time to kind of re-speed up and find that speed off the wall and transition and carry all your speed that you had from the previous lap into the next one. So for me, it's the push, setting up the push and then getting into my underwater kicks and then being able to drive and connect into my my transition of swimming okay and underwater kicks for freestyle you can do the butterfly kick correct yes okay. yeah so you go into the turn push off the wall and then start doing butterfly kicks and then transitioning into freestyle kicks so another thing they talk about is how long you stay under on that side of it yeah so uh, you know did you come up too soon or did you uh -huh. come up not soon enough so there's a lot of discussion that do you, I, I assume you have a preference. Yeah. So, um, I love turns. Um, I grew up swimming short course versus long course. So there were more turns. And so I use that too in my advantage. And so I like to, I don't stay underwater super long, like some people, but I really like to utilize that part of my race and to my advantage, um, and really just use it as a connecting point of my swimming. So I don't stay under like a long time, but definitely use the turns to my advantage. How can you tell when a swimmer is tired? And I don't know if you, maybe how do you feel when you think, oh gosh, I can't kick it in for the last lap or something's slipping away from me? Because that's another thing they talk about on the broadcast is like that last final kick and who's got the, the engine still running and who's running out of steam. Yeah, so it depends on the person and how they race. So a lot of people will race at a high tempo. Other people will race at a low tempo, slower kick, different kicks. For me personally, when I start, like you can really tell as my hips start dropping from being high in the water to low in the water. And then my tempo just becomes really slow. Like I'm moving in slow motion, swimming through mud. So it, it really depends on the person. But for me personally, it just kind of like looks like I'm not moving forward anymore and it depends on the race like a 200 butterfly that's a good one to watch because you can really really tell those people that are really struggling at the end just because it's so taxing on their bodies and they just start to really fall apart and then it's just more it's a little more obvious and harder to keep it together in a race like that like freestyle you can fake it a little bit and just keep your stroke connected a little bit better but butterfly just can be really tough for some people. So on, on race day, you warm up and then you've got heats and finals. And what do you do in all that downtime? There seems to be a lot of downtime in swimming. Well, well, even before we go there, can, yeah. can we just walk through what it, oh, yeah. cause I'm always so confused as to what happens because I'm, I was never a swimmer. I just, you know, see the finals on TV. Uh -huh. So how does that, how do we get there? Okay. So so I'll take you through like a race day. Okay. So you wake up, I usually um, go eat breakfast, normal pre, like I would assume most athletes, sports do this, go eat and then um, get ready to go to the pool, head to the pool. I'll do like a stretching out of the pool, warm up activation. I have like a little routine that I do. And then I'll get in the pool, do a warm up, depending on where I'm at in the season, whether it's like a big meet, a smaller meet I have. It's a pretty similar warm up throughout the year, but some things just like are tweaked a little bit. Depending on how I feel, I'll talk to my coach and add extra or take some off. I'll practice one or two starts and then the meet will start. So like I like to be out of the pool and like relax before my race. I like to dry off, sit down, maybe have some Gatorade, maybe a little snack again um, before I race. And then that at bigger meets, you have to put on your racing suit. So that takes a little bit of time. So then you go put on your suit um, and then you get ready. So then at a big meet, um, you'll, so this is a prelim, so a prelim swim, um, a big meet, you'll um, go in and they'll like marshal you to your 
your block and you'll you'll race and most of the time a prelim swim you're either trying to qualify top eight which qualifies you for the final if it's like a prelim final event but like at the olympics there will be prelim semifinals and finals so the same with olympic trials so at olympic trials you're swimming the prelim and you're trying to get top 16 so you can swim in the semifinal and then you move to when you move to the semifinal you'll try to qualify top eight to move to the final so that's like the prelim is to qualify for the semi or the final. And then if you do that, if once you race, you see what you get, no matter what, you could then go warm down, talk to your coaches, watch your videos, kind of understand the race, what you can improve on, what you did well, and then go back, nap, eat, get a massage, this, do other recovery techniques, whatever you need. Just try to relax as much as possible and then you go back warm up do all the same things again and get ready for the finals and usually finals are a little bit more hype um, and they add like all the smoke and mirrors and they walk you out and it's a little more intense um, just because it's the final and like what you see on tv like they want that's what they want they want the hype they want the super intense racing um, they see you they show the ready room everyone's super serious and in their zone and a lot of times the ready room can be like that but then it can also be the complete opposite everyone's talking enjoying each other and just like kind of going with the flow so it depends on the meet depends on the race you're in and then things like that do you have different suits for different races yes yeah, so um i'm sponsored by arena and so they have um, a few different suits to race in and so i have well last year i had one suit that I would wear for like the 150 and then another suit that I would wear for the 200. Um, but now they just came out with a brand new suit for 2020, which I'm super excited to wear. It's a really awesome suit. It looks so good and it, I feel great in it. It fits my body really well. So I'll be racing all my events in that. What makes a good suit? Um, I think it's totally personal preference. Everyone's body type is different. So it's really important to feel for you to feel comfortable and what somebody else feels comfortable in doesn't mean that's going to be comfortable for you size fit whatever so for me I just really like to feel like I'm really high in the water and it's helping me get into the right body position and then personally I like my suit to be tight but like not too tight and some people hate it to be tight at all or some people want it just like crushing their legs um, so it's totally personal preference and just kind of getting used to being in, a, in the suit and understanding what makes you feel fast and making sure you can do the start well and the turn well and that it's not cutting off your circulation by the end of the race and that you can clear your lactate after the race and all different stuff. And there's definitely not, I mean, there's a lot of great suits out there. I love Arena and I think it's the best suit, but it's totally up to you, like personal preference and how it fits your body. But a lot of like Arena, Arena offers multiple different suits for people to to be able to have different body types and they understand that everyone is different so I think that's why it works so well so when you're on a national team or even on your collegiate team how much uh, say do you have in your own suit so when you're um, on the national team you can wear whatever suit you would like they don't limit that every um, most of like the professional athletes all have their own suit sponsors and work with the suit sponsors to work on the suits and develop the best suits for them. My college team was sponsored by tier. And so that's what I wore. And most college teams are sponsored by a brand and that's what everybody wears. And that's the suits that they're provided with. So that's what you wear. I mean, if you have a serious issue with it, like on my, my college team, if they had somebody had a serious issue with a suit, they would help them figure it out and make it work. Um, but you kind of were told what to wear. But on the national team, you can wear whatever you want. So do some of your suits have like bicycle short length legs versus what I think of as a traditional one piece suit? Yes. Yeah, so all racing suits like that you'll see in the Olympics, all females will go down to the like right above the knee. And mm -hmm. then will just be like a normal suit on the top, like a tank top sort of. And that's how all racing suits are now. You have to, so FINA is the governing body of all water sports. And so every suit after 2009 has to be approved by FINA and ha has a sticker on it that you have to get scanned in at every meet to make sure your suit is compliant with the rules and like 
a certain thickness, a certain whatever that it's okay to race in and it's not, you're not cheating basically. Yeah. I remember the, a few years back, I think it was Ian Thorpe who started wearing the full body. Yeah. And there was a lot of controversy around that that was cheating. Yes. So in 2000, up till 2009, they were called the rubber suits and they were super thick, full body suits and really just were insane. And people were going really fast, but almost every world record from that era has been broken. I think there's only a few left. Um, So it's crazy how much the sport has changed and gotten faster, even without that technology. Um, They still have great technology and are continuing to develop and understand how to make the best suits and make us swim as fast as we can. Okay, so now I get to ask the inappropriate question. (laughs) Because I remember, I want to say it was 2012, there was a swimmer whose suit tore Uh right before the race started, and she still had to race in her torn suit. Has this ever happened to you? A wardrobe malfunction? I've never torn it in front of and like and like right before a race, but I've raced with like a hole in my suit, not necessarily in an inappropriate place, but it's actually quite easy to poke a hole, especially being girls getting like most girls get their nails done for big big meets, and so it's actually quite easy to poke holes through the suits and can be it can be really stressful and they're easy easy to rip. They're so hard to put on, they're so tight on your body that um, if it's really hot in the locker rooms or just Sometimes the suits are just smaller than other times, which is, I discussed how they're manufactured and it can be like impossible to get the suits on or they'll just rip or, um, it can be really stressful actually in 2016 before my first race at trials, I ripped my suit like in half and I was like, Oh my gosh. And I was panicking, trying to find my coach, trying to get me a suit. And luckily, very fortunately enough, like, we have access to suits and there's people there to help you. And it, it was all fine, but it can be very stressful. And I know a few people who have gone up and raced and their suit is just ripped and just have to go for it. A little adrenaline rush and hope for the best that it stays together. And hope the splashing is well yeah. placed. <laughs> <laughs> we, you know, we haven't even talked about caps and goggles. Do you also get that from arena or do you use other brands? Yeah. So I'm, fully sponsored by arena all my swimming gear all my equipment i get from arena caps goggles fins paddles anything i need for training all that kind of stuff um i love everything they give me they just come out with brand new goggles that i absolutely love and i always have the really cute designs for practice suits um their new 2020 line is coming out soon and i'm so excited to like i'm so spoiled they spoil me so much i have so many suits and everyone's like oh they're so cute and i love wearing the new ones and I'm really fortunate and lucky to have such an awesome sponsor nice now are you a double capper I'm not I have a lot of hair you guys can't see but (laughs) um I have a lot of hair and so I just go um for just a normal latex cap go one cap or put my goggles over it everyone makes fun of me like oh why are you why don't you put another cap on I was like "I, I just don't like it it doesn't fit over my head well it's what I've always done too. So a little superstitious. Yeah. I think it's so funny because so many swimmers have all of this amazing hair. Uh huh. And I'm always like, how does your hair survive? And you all have all this beautiful hair. Good shampoo. Yes. There's shampoo. I, apparently, but still, I'm just, I'm always amazed. I think my hair has gotten so used to it that it's just like, ah, oh, I have to adapt. <laughs> or fall out and that's just not happening yeah do you have different goggles for different like types of light yeah mainly the difference is like indoor goggles like are a little bit lighter and then i'll wear like super dark mirror goggles if i'm training outside or swimming outside but that's really the only difference the goggles that i wear are mirrored and so you can't really see my eyes i don't some people like clear like completely clear goggles but i don't like i don't like people to see my eyes when i'm swimming and so i that's my preference, but everybody has their, their own preference and what they well, like. Well, why don't you want them to see your eyes? I don't know. I feel like I look like a bug and also like in practice, not that this happens very often, almost never actually. Like if I want need to cry, I don't want my coaches to see that I'm crying. 
<laughs> that's a, it really rarely ever happens. Like I can count on one hand in the past like five years that that has happened, but you know, sometimes you just gotta let it out. And so nobody can see. Usually people These goggles, they must be failing. I'm not crying. There's, they're not, they're not. <laughs> and they're, the mirrored ones are super intimidating. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I, I just think it looks good. And yeah, you look intimidating. And that's, I've always worn them, I think, growing up. And so I think that's just what I'm used to, too. So it is an Olympic year and you are training for the trials. What does that look like for you? I think that's, um, like people think it's like this so it's the olympic year like this really big year but really what our goal is is trying to like be the same um not change a whole lot just focusing on um what we've been doing right over the past four years and really just doing what we do best and trying to get a little bit better each day doing nothing drastically different and just having fun with it like i'm super fortunate to be in this position to be able to race at trials to have an opportunity to even be on the Olympic team, um, obviously anything can happen between now and Olympic trials, anything can happen at Olympic trials. So I'm just looking at it as a great opportunity to do what I love. Like this is my job and I'm super lucky to do um, what I love every single day. And I don't want to take it for granted because I know in 10, 15 years, I won't necessarily be able to do this. I mean, maybe, uh, who knows what our bodies will be able to do, but I'm just really enjoying it and trying to get it just a little, little bit better every day. Now, swimmers, I know, are a pretty superstitious lot. Uh-huh. So what what do you bring with you to the pool every time when they do walkouts, and what what's yours? I don't have, like, a thing that I bring, but I have, like, a pre-race, like, kind of routine that I do. It's, like, kind of hard to explain. So when you walk out to the blocks, I, like, smack my legs, smack my arms. I don't like odd numbers, so I have to do everything in even numbers super OCD I know and then um, I touch my goggles three times before I swim and then I am ready on the blocks so that that's like kind of my thing and I'm small like I have like like these thoughts and like rituals in my head that I go through but nothing like there's not something I bring every time or something that I like have that's like superstitious but it's more of like the actions that I go through on meet day and stuff like that I'm always disturbed by the slapping when I watch <laughs> See, because... like, I don't slap my, some of the guys really slap themselves. Yes! Like, really, yeah. really slap myself. I just, like, kind of loosen the muscles. I, I wouldn't even, like, consider it a slap. It's, like, more of, like, a, all right, let's get the muscles going. Just kind of a little bit of shock. The guys will have, like, bruises. Uh, 12 on them. months. I'm like, waiting for the, you know, the, the, the cat and nine tails to come out and they start beating themselves. I just I don't know what's <laughs> happening. Yeah, it's crazy. It gets intense. It gets really intense. Far out. I have a quick question. It, do you notice when you're swimming in a temporary pool? No. I mean, I've swam in so many. I think now that it's just normal. It's totally like a normal pool. It's just there for a little bit. But I personally like them. They always feel super fast, um, have like the best technology. So um, oh, I yeah. don't notice it at all. What is a fast pool versus a slow pool? Temperature is a big thing. Depth of the pool, the way the gutters are set up, personal preference. But there are definitely like pools that are faster than other pools. Just like the way they're set up and the way the gutters are. I don't know all the like science or math behind it, and whatnot. But there's definitely some pools that are engineered that are just going to be faster than others. Do you like uh, wa- warmer or colder water? I like colder as much as I hate it, but I like to race in a colder pool. I would much rather have like a warmer pool to practice in, but not too warm because like, you're working so hard and for like two hours at a time, you don't want to overheat. But I would prefer a colder pool over a warmer pool. All right, Allison, do you have anything else? I have so much else, but I will control <laughs> myself. <laughs> I mean, we could get into shampoo and razors and all kinds of things. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Okay. No, wait. Oh, shampoo. What shampoo do you use? Whatever I feel, whatever smells good at the store. I don't have. have okay. Specific. You don't, you don't use like the special get the chlorine out shampoos. No. Nope. How often do you shave? I actually um, have a lot of hair, dark like hair. So I shave often, but like, I don't like to shave before meats unless it's a big meat. 
So like most people will grow out their leg hair for a big meet, but my leg hair gets so long and so dark that I have to shave it. Like people will go months. And I, if I go like two weeks, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is horrible. Wait, so people don't shave as much as they, like you used to hear about people like shaving their arms and shaving all the hair off because that was going to create some kind of drag. Yeah, so only for big meets. So like the like year end, like your end of season meet, that's what you like. You'll wait until the end to shave it all off, so you're like fastest at that, if that makes sense. So you like wait to shave, like you keep the hair, so it like helps you train. Well, I think a lot of it is superstition and just like how it's been done for so long. But then you shave at you day for your big meet. You know, because the body hair weighs so much, it's like a weighted belt. <laughs> I, it's yeah, true. it's it's actually like the best feeling in the world after you shave and you dive in for the first time. It feels so good. You just feel so like connected with the water. I don't know. It it always baffles me the the hair. <laughs> Any See, other burning questions? <laughs> no, I was gonna say I, I'm Italian American. I know all about shaving <laughs> all kinds of parts of my body. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much, Mallory. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Mallory. You can follow Mallory on uh, Twitter at Mal underscore Comerford and on Insta at Mal Comerford. We will have links to both of those in the show notes. I mean, like, she's got a sweet deal with Arena because I looked up at how much those technical racing suits are, and they're, like, a good four or $500. Re- well, I mean, swimsuits, just ordinary yeah, swimsuits are, are expensive. Like, yes, swimsuits are expensive, and I can tell you it matters because I've got one that's not so great right now. It's just kind of a a regular catalog brand it's not really from a swimming company and oh boy i tell you i do not like swimming in that thing you know swimming is one of those sports where you can just this is a really fun interview for me because you can just watch swimming the person who touches the wall first wins right it's the concept is not hard you don't really need to understand it Mm -hmm. and i never did because i can barely swim and Hearing all the technical things, though, of the turns and the takeoffs and the, li- I'm excited to watch it again. Oh, good, good, with good. A different, with a different eye. It's like, you know, there's so much more into it. Like when we talked to Don Harper Nelson, it's mm-hmm. like you run, you jump, but you know, there's so much more to it. So it's great when you can hear what that actually is. Right. And, you know, it, the way she said some stuff, too, even though I do swim, still I'll do laps in the pool, you know, it, I get in my brain that, oh, it's harder to kick hard and fast. And when I do it in the pool, it's harder to kick hard and fast. But I don't equate that to watching a really good swimmer race and kick that hard and fast for a long, long time. So. Yes, with her gorgeous hair with whatever shampoo is on the shelf. I know. Lucky her. Lucky her. You know, when you're 40, Mallory. That might not be the case. <laughs> everything sags including your hair (laughs) just kidding we don't know we're not that old yet maybe (laughs) not but let's move on to our team olympic fever update tofu our team olympic fever update is where we check in with our past guests and it's sponsored by pincollector.com pin collector is the world's largest free online community for olympic pin collectors that allows you to easily catalog value and show off your collection you can buy sell and trade pins on the site and they have rates that are lower than other online platforms it's a really great place to go and really understand like an entire catalog or an entire Olympics worth of pins versus going to like an auction site and seeing stuff one off. So it's a really cool place to hang out. I am on there and you should be too. Visit pincollector.com and sign up today. Thanks to our partnership with Pin Collector, we have our very own Olympic fever pin. Become a Patreon patron or make a one-time PayPal donation of $20 and you can get yours. Visit olimfever.com slash support hyphen the hyphen show for more information so we have good news and we have bad news we have good news well let's start with the bad news yes sadly our sport climber josh levin did not make the olympics he didn't do so great at nationals did he no no he did not and he i mean he did great at nationals for himself and he'd been training really hard and he pushed himself really hard and he performed better than he ever has just 
within the competition, the results didn't match what he had achieved for himself. So that's really sad, but he's happy with what he's achieved and he's ready to start a new chapter. But we hope that doesn't mean that he will forget about us. I know. I would feel unloved. I'm more excited to see what you do next, Josh, and all the best to you. And then our karate athlete Tom Scott competed at the Karate One Premier League in Paris this past weekend. This was a big qualifier for Tokyo in terms of points, and he unfortunately lost in the first round, which is really sad. So hopefully uh, there should be some few more events to uh, before the Tokyo qualification is all, all done. So Tom, we're still rooting for you. You still have got time. Can we get to some good news? We can get to some good news. Claire Egan finished sixth in the 15-kilometer individual race at Polkluga last week, which means she got, in, what they say, in the flowers. So she's not on the podium, but, like, the next three get flowers and get part of the uh, honors at the end of the race. And and, and and that's one of her best finishes. Yes. Nice. Yeah. And in the world of biathlon, that also means you earn some money. So, oh, even better. Yeah, I know. So that's always a good thing, too. The rest of the weekend, she was 26th in the mass start, and she and the relay team finished 12th in the 4 by 75 kilometer mixed relay. So that was a good race for her. Yeah, she had a great weekend. That's good because World Championships is coming up. So hopefully that gives her uh, little a little boost. Lot. Yeah, a little boost. Momentum. That weekend. Yep. Okay. I saw this on Instagram because they had the cutest gender reveal. So triathlete Joe Malloy and his wife Jen announced they're having a baby girl and they hit a golf ball that burst into pink. Oh, uh, yeah, I saw that. That was reveal. so cute. Really cute. And they were very excited. So congratulations to them. That's very exciting. We love Team Olympic feet for babies. Let's move on to our Tokyo 2020 update. Nothing I love better than a technical uniform, and they were released this past week. I think I saw this and immediately tagged you. Oh, yeah, because, like, seriously, whenever I and I remember watching London and and I would just look past the track and field athletes to the technical officials in the background and be like, I want one of those blazers. I really want one. Well, now you could get a jaunty scarf. I would prefer the necktie, but the whole ensemble is really cool. And it it plays off of the uh, squares that are in the logo of Tokyo. So it's a blazer and pants combination. I think they have different length pants. No skirts, so um, but they're all made for uh, cooling very well as well. So people will not swelter in the heat and humidity of Tokyo. And they have the beautiful jaunty scarf for the ladies where you can, mm-hmm. you know, mop your brow, I guess, <laughs> if it gets a little sweaty. But they do sort of have like a Panama hat. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's those the technical officials will be looking mighty sharp in Tokyo. Yes. Uh, speaking of needing to cool off. There has been an issue with some of their cooling plants because Japan has had low snowfall this year and they were planning on using the snow to help cool things during the summer at the Olympics. Oh, so this was part of that plan where they were blowing the cool air off the snow? Yeah, you know, that's what I thought immediately as well. So the Guardian had the story and they were going to take the snow and make it into giant mounds so that fans could cool down before and after sports events and spectators would be given like sealed bags of snow for to use as cooling packs. So they didn't mention the blowing snow, which I I have a feeling they're not going to do that system because it didn't work so well or sound were, like there it was so some well. you never know. You never know, but um, that's not one of the situations that they mentioned in this article. So that's um, a little worrisome for Japan and trying to figure out how they're going to keep everyone cool. I'm sorry, little bags of snow sounds like a really dumb idea. Do you think? It does. Because how long are those little sealed bags of snow going to last? I don't know. And I also wonder, well, why don't they make ice packs if they're sealing snow? Why don't they just make ice? Yeah. So, I don't know. We'll see what happens. Oh, man. I am getting more and more concerned about this heat issue because it just doesn't feel like they've got a handle on it at all. Like, how is this a surprise? I don't think it's a surprise to the Japanese, but I think that the Western media 
has kind of went, oh, wait, what? It's hot? We're fragile. We're, we're snowfla- special snowflakes here. And we will melt. Right? So I think it's going to be rough for a lot of people, and it probably could be rough on some athletic competitions. And I think if you prepare, you'll do well. Which reminds me, I have to go start my sauna training because I seriously thought about sitting in the sauna for various lengths of time, working my way up to maybe 10, 15 minutes to see how I do in the heat. But that's just a dry heat. It's not humidity. But we we got to train. Got to do something. Got to be doing. Ca- I, I do my inner Lou Jones, you know, and exactly. And- I've been doing my couch training for yes. weeks now. Yeah, how's that going? It's going pretty well. Good. <laughs> I I can last on that couch like you would not believe. <laughs> Grace Note Sports has released its forecasted virtual metal table. So Grace Note Sports, it's a Nielsen company. And so one of their products is this virtual metal table that can forecast how many medals will be at the Olympics. And so they have updated with the top, they gave the list of whom they believe will be the top 30 medal winning countries in Japan. And they'll tweak this. They believe that the top five will be US, China, Russia, Japan, and Australia. So do they give what these numbers represent? Like, do do they have actual individual? They do. They say they, they do. think the okay. go- that the U.S. will win 47 golds, 36 silvers, and 34 bronzes. Oh, yes. Well, I'm kind of surprised to see Russia because obviously they think Russia's going. And right. all those athletes right. are and... not going to be banned well, I mean, maybe they said, well, we don't know for sure, so we just better keep it in this release. And when we, you know, if they do another one closer to or when they, when teams are finalized and they know who's competing, maybe there's going to be adjustments to this. But, but I this think this is something, to... yeah, put in the hopper and figure out how accurate they were at the end of the games. Hey, Kazakhstan is winning a medal. <laughs> and you know how the Kazakhs love me. <laughs> I will celebrate that medal. Actually, well, they have them on point to win uh, one gold, three silvers, seven bronzes. We'll see how my Kazakh friends do. There you go. Oh, we've got some news from Rio 2016. Is it bad news, like how everything is falling apart? Yes, it is. Uh, A judge closed the Olympic Park because of safety concerns. So it's quite literally falling apart. Yes, exactly. Hold on. I'm pulling up a story from the BBC. And the city's authorities had not provided safety guarantees for the Olympic Park to hold public events, said a judge in ruling that the venues needed to be closed. Wow. So poor maintenance. I don't know. It's sad. The, this is the Olympic Park that had the velodrome, aquatics and tennis centers and several arenas. Right now it's a public park and it hosts... Well, right now it's not doing anything, but it's a public park. It had events like music festivals, other tournaments, and a bunch of athletes trained there as well. So in the different areas. So that's a surprise, but still sad. Yes. And always makes me go, IOC, what were you thinking? I know. I mean, I know what they were thinking. They were thinking we want a games in South America. Mm Mm-hmm. And Brazil probably told them, we can give you a great games in South America. Listen to our passion. They were swayed by that passion. I know. And I'm worried that they did that again for 2026. As am I. That that they've fallen to the Latin spirit. It's like they learned nothing from Athens when they made the decision to have it in Rio. I get the hope, but like... Japanese won't let that happen. No, they won't. Will they? We might melt. (laughs) We might implode from the heat, but darn it, those stadiums are going to get used again. Speaking of Olympics and venues, we were talking about the 2030 bids a couple of weeks ago, and the Sarajevo Times is reporting that the government of Catalonia is considering to include Sarajevo in its winter Olympic bid for 2030. I cannot wrap my head around this. I mean, it's like Sweden and Latvia, that bid, the Stockholm Aro bid. On steroids. <laughs> okay, so I know my grasp of geography is poor, but Sarajevo and Spain are nowhere near each other. That is correct. 
And it's not even like a short plane ride. It's probably a few hours. I mean, it's it's better than Paris to Tahiti. <laughs> but it's not We are in the same it, continent. It's not it's not Stockholm to Segolda. How about that? <laughs> yeah. I mean, on the one hand, I love the idea of including Sarajevo. Mm -hmm. That was such a beautiful game, and that city suffered so much. Right. But this is weird. Yeah, I know. I, I just don't know. The, the article does not have much in it. Because it's not like any of the Sarajevo venues would be usable. They were all destroyed. Right. But I mean, there are remnants there. I've read stories about groups of people trying to like restore the the bobsled and loose track to huh. make it usable again. I mean, it's covered in graffiti, but I hear that they've had some summer stuff there, like just wow. been able to do some training or things in the summer. So I don't remember what is left. That's something to look into. I think there is some kind of stadium that's still functional, but I need to do a little bit of research into that. When we talked about the new norm and we talked, they were talking about regional bids and including yes. multiple cities and spreading the wealth and including even multiple countries like the uh, Stockholm bid. Mm -hmm. And then we had the whole thing with Tahiti. So I guess Catalonia and Sarajevo, maybe. not so strange. Maybe. Not so strange. And, and if it happened, like maybe that would be a way to revital get some investment money that they could bring some of those venues back to life. Yes. Sarajevo is a favorite of mine. Yeah. Torgalindine. Yes, and just that particular Olympic sticks in my brain. Very, I guess I was the right age. Okay. And it was made such an impression on me and Katarina Vitt and all the skating that year and even the skiing. I remember the US had these funky 80s you know, with the beanies and the, the, we didn't call them beanies back then. And they had the square medals. Oh, that's right. That's right. I thought those were very cool. So I, I would not mind going back to Sarajevo. Okay, that would yeah. be one I would want to go to, actually. Oh, gotcha. Okay. I would want to go. So like, that's going to make a big difference. To come <laughs> I want to go. So T-Bock, if you're listening, I'd like to go back to Sarajevo. So if you can, you know, swing that, I'd be happy. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. I guess on that note, that will wrap it up for this week. Let us know what you thought of swimming with Mallory Comerford. Email us at olimfever at gmail.com. Call our voicemail hotline at 53070-FEVER. We're Olim Fever on Twitter and Insta and Olympic Fever Podcast Group on Facebook. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, keep the flame alive. I mean, it's all based on math. Do 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 do.